Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, oh, Eugene Ormandy. Here it is. The Philadelphia Orchestra, the Columbia Stereo Collection, 1958 to 1963, on 88 fun-filled CDs. I have to tell you something about this particular video. I made it already, only to realize I forgot to turn on the camera. Uh -huh. That was like when my father, we were visiting the West and we were going to see Alcatraz. We were in San Francisco and my dad took a whole you know, roll of film without taking the lens cap off of his camera too. It must run in the family. So here we are doing it again. Um, and uh, this one's going to come out rather different because in the first one, the cat was running around and now she's in the other room. So thank God I can just talk about music. Uh, wow. 58 to 63, they made 88 CDs worth of stuff. Is that unbelievable? Doesn't that tell you how the record industry has changed? I mean, they made all these CDs Columbia issued them. They made money on them. Columbia paid for them. I mean, the relationship between the orchestra and the label, I mean, it's, it's astonishing. It's, it's, it's unheard of. It's, it's, just, it's just dazzling. So this will presumably be the first of two boxes because um, they have to get through 1968 when, when Ormandy flipped to RCA or somewhere around there, 68, the late 60s. And maybe there'll be an RCA box too. That could be interesting. You'll notice this is a, 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 a rectangle. It's not a square. So it doesn't have like the big coffee table book. It's not like the mono series. Could be they're economizing a little bit. Um, I have no problem with the smaller size. I don't care if they economize a little bit as long as they release the stuff. So because they're going chronologically, there will be bits of things that, that aren't in here. For example, the Brahms cycle, which was completed later. Um, and, and Beethoven and other things like that. So we're going to have to be patient and not get all annoyed because they're taking it basically chronologically. Let's, let's take the, uh, the box off here. Hmm. Opening Pandora's box. No, actually it's not. It's, it's mostly really wonderful stuff. And for those of you who are not American, um, these were the reference recordings when we were growing up. Philadelphia and Ormandy in the 60s and 70s, they were the biggest sellers in the United States. A lot of this stuff wasn't released abroad, um, and this was how we learned the repertoire. Uh, there was, of course, Cleveland Orchestra and Cell, and there was Chicago with Reiner, and there was New York Phil with, with Bernstein and Metropolis and other people, the Boston Symphony, of course, with Munch. I mean, we had such a wonderful domestic, um, you know, a, a, domestic selection of things. It was really kind of amazing. We were spoiled for choice in many, many ways. But these recordings, Ormandy and Philly, were the top sellers, the most popular and the way, way we learned the music. These are original jackets, as you can see. They look like little albums. And if you take them out, you can see they have original jackets and original notes, which if you have a magnifying glass here, you may be able to read. Uh, and it's, it, you know, these are nicely done, nicely done. The recordings have been, I think some of them remastered. They seem to sound a little better than they used to, but sometimes it's just because you're listening and under different circumstances or the humidity is different or you're paying closer attention. Um, and uh, there's a very nice note by Rob Cowan, um, our good friend from, from, from the UK, uh, which is lots of fun. And so let's go through it, shall we? We start with... Uh, we do have track lists, track lists. You get like all the things that are in here, one disc at a time. And then there's an index at the back. Um, yes, there's an index at the back, which is lovely and quite handy. And let's see, analog to tape transfers. Yes, there are some remasterings in here, which is good. Um, okay. <sighs> here we go. So much stuff. Respighi. Pines, fountains, Roman festivals. Well, I, I don't like these performances very much. It's funny. I mean, fountains is okay. Festivals is okay until you get to the end where he kind of like eliminates a lot of the percussion parts because um, it's very noisy, of course. Um, and and the, the, the Pines is, is again, the, the final march just doesn't have the, 
Well, let's put it this way. These were like were like classic versions. They were recorded in 58, but there was Reiner. And, you know, people liked Philadelphia because of the sensuality of the sound. And that's true. And the catacombs and the night thing. I mean, you know, the strings are just luscious and it's beautiful. But for slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> you know, the power in the march and the concluding march and in the big moments, others did it better. And they've done it better since. So um, I find these performances a little bit faded. I really do. Graffe, the Grand Canyon Suite. Oh, this is great. Oh, this is wonderful. See, this has all the brashness and color and, and atmosphere that I don't hear in the Respighi, um, I, however admired they were in their day. I think that this Graffe is just fantastic. It's all, that's all that's on the CD, by the way. It's a 32-minute CD. Some of these couple things, and there, there's more stuff, and some things are a little bit, um, you know, they get to sell more CDs that way. Prokofiev F5. Uh, well, where's the tam-tam at the climax, the first movement, and then the, the slow movement, and the adagio. But boy, it's a very good performance otherwise. Um, I, I, don't, I don't find it to be, you know, as compelling as later versions. It's, it's that simple. Some of these things hold up, some, some of them don't. It's that, the way life goes. Grieg, Piano Concerto, and the Paganini Rhapsody with Philippe Entremont. Oh, I just recognized the cover. There, see, there's the cover. I had this growing up. I had so many of these growing up. Aldermont was a very solid pianist, and these performances are lovely. And of course, Ormandy was the ultimate accompanist. They, they were just, they're like old friends hearing them. And some people may just say, well, come on, there's so many better versions of that. And there are, there are, but th these are perfectly respectable. Sibelius, Symphonies 2 and 7. Oh, boy. Okay, well, these are combined. That's a 66-minute CD. Sibelius 7. Well, this is, you know, Ormandy did it twice. Um, he once for, for these guys, and then for RCA, he rewrites a lot of it. I, the f final page is completely rescored to give more brass and, and make it more triumphant than Sibelius may be intended. And then the string playing, that pastoral interlude, when they're going, da da wum ba -dun, da da wum ba da da you know, in his remake, he plays it more or less the way Sibelius wrote it, um, which was a good thing. Here, it's very idiosyncratic, but it's fun for that reason. The second symphony, well, there are two ways to do the second symphony, right? Because it's a transitional piece, and you can play it more like Tchaikovsky, older Sibelius, or you can play it more like neoclassical, later Sibelius. Um, so my favorite recording of the second is still is still Zell, Concertgebouw, or Zell Live in Tokyo. Um, this is not that. This is the Tchaikovsky style, and it's perfectly legitimate. It's a beautiful performance, um, and it, it doesn't dawdle. I, I would have preferred maybe a little bit more oomph in the finale, but, you know, Ormandy and Sibelius were a wonderful combination. Uh, then we've got, oh, I love this one, Liszt, Rhapsodies. Hungarian Rhapsodies 1 and 2, Inescu, Romanian Rhapsodies 1 and 2, Liszt, Liebestraum, oh, juicy, delicious, lovely, they're so good at that stuff. And then CD7 is a real novelty, Norman Dello Gioio, Air Power, the symphonic suite based on music from the CBS television show. It's a film score, 38 minutes, you've got Mission in the Sky, you've got war scenes, you've got frolics of the early days, I, this is good stuff fun to listen to and and basically pretty much sui generis i mean this this was you weren't going to find this anywhere else <laughs> it's hard to find it anywhere else today so that's marvelous there are novelties sprinkled in amongst this stuff that are quite fun to listen to bizet carmen sweets one and two of course that's meat and potatoes stuff mozart uh symphonia concertante for oboe clarinet horn and bassoon this this is a disc dedicated to the amazing soloists of the of the Philadelphia Orchestra Wind and Strings. You've got John Delancey Oboe, Anthony Giliotti, uh, clarinet, Mason Jones, and on the horn, and Bernard Garfield bassoon. You've got the Haydn Symphony Concertant with Jacob Krachmalik violin and Lauren Monroe cello and the two wind guys, and the trumpet concerto, the Haydn trumpet concerto with Gilbert Johnson. So these are just wonderful to hear, these amazing players. Prokofiev, Peter and the Wolf with Cyril Richard. Cyril Richard narrating. Oh, I grew up with that one. And Britain's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. They're great. Just great. Tchaikovsky and Mendelssohn Violin Concertos with Isaac Stern. Um, 
Stern, you know, Stern always gets crapped on by everybody. I don't understand why. He was a first-class violinist, and these are beautiful performances. And again, you've got the ultimate accompanist in Normandy. I mean, everyone poo-poos that, saying, well, you know, who wants to hear an accompanist? But he could really accompany. Um, you know, the, it, by that I mean he's sensitive to the soloist, but the orchestra still has its character, its own personality. It's a genuine partner in the proceedings. That's a gift. It may be a small gift compared to some of the others we care about more, but it's still a gift. Uh, Brahms, First Symphony. Now, Ormandy was a fantastic Brahms conductor, period. Really was. I mean, he just really played it beautifully. Sensitive, uh, smart, shapely. Uh, it's a gorgeous Brahms first. Now, it's coupled with the variations in view on a theme of Handel not the Haydn variations, as orchestrated by Edmund Rubra. I'm amazed by the Rubra orchestration. Somebody said I pronounced Rubra wrong. It's really Rubra or Rubber or something. I don't really care. It's Rubra. Here's the point. He was a lousy orchestrator. He always was. He was a lousy orchestrator of his own symphonies. It wasn't until like Symphony Number no. 5 that he figured out, you know, how to orchestrate with real like, you know, clarity and point. And uh, these this orchestration is muddy. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not very colorful or interesting, but it's sort of unique. Um, so there you go. It was the kind of thing Ormandy would do, and good for him, because he was always into doing premieres of all kinds of things. Uh, the Lord's Prayer. You had to be there. This is one of those American things. It's got, like, unbelievable stuff on it. Well, you, you do get uh, the Londonderry Air and the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and David's Lamentation by William Billings and, and Unfold Ye Portals by Gounod from La Rédemption and just all kinds of little strange excerpts and little religious things with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir in Philadelphia, they were like, you know, they sold millions. If you, even if your grandmother hated classical music, you went to her record cabinet and that would be in there. Not in my grandmother's cabinet. My grandmother had the Bruno Walter Mahler second along with her Arthur Murray dance records. How that got there, I have no clue. But there you go. Uh, oh, it does have Hall's Psalm 148, Lord, who hast made us for thine own. It's all a really remarkable selection of pieces, but, you know, okay, for limited taste. Franck, Symphonic Variations with Robert Casadesu and the Dandy Symphony on a French Mountain Air. What a great record that is. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful music that doesn't get played anymore. It's terrific. Back to Entremont, the Liszt Piano Concertos. Yeah, all right. It's okay. Tchaikovsky, yes, the 1812 Overture with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir of the Valley Forge Military Academy Band. I had this one too. Of course, I didn't, I never liked the chorus in the 1812 Overture. Some of you said you don't mind it, but I, I, I find it not helpful. But it's a whopping performance of the 1812. Then you get Barden in the Steps of Central Asia, the Palofsky and Dances, also with voices, which I really don't like. Uh, Masorsky, Night on Bald Mountain, Kachaturi and Gallop, Dance of the Young Maiden, Shostakovich, Polka, Rimsky, Korsakov, Polonaise from Christmas Eve, The Dance of the Tumblers from the Snow Maiden, Kabalevsky, Comedian's Gallop, Masorsky, Hopa, Kachaturi and Saber Dance, Rimsky, Korsakov, Slava, all with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir where they can tabernacle. So there you go. Debussy, the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. You know, Ormandy is known for his, you know, sensuality and voluptuousness and all that, but he gets through the afternoon of a fawn in eight minutes and 56 seconds, which is really, really quick compared to a lot of others. I mean, Stokowski takes like 11 minutes at it. You know, even Boulez is like longer, I think. But the point is, is that he had that wonderful sexiness and gorgeousness of tone, but he wasn't a slow conductor. One of the reasons it was so marvelous is because he still cut through the music and, and with rhythm and tempo, and he doesn't get enough credit for that. It's not just the Philadelphia sound. It's the Philadelphia sound in tempo that makes it so wonderful. It's a great afternoon of a fawn. Daphnis and Chloe by Ravel, second suite. Marvelous La Mer, excellent La Mer, beautiful. Um, Tchaikovsky, piano concerto number one, and... And Chopin's second piano concerto with Eugene Istomin. Oh, that's nice. 
I had these too. Those are very nice performances. Mozart, Eine kleine Nachtmusik, the Bach era, and a G-string, Corelli, Christmas Concerto, and Mendelssohn's Scherzo from the Octet, the strings of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And believe me, you always want to hear the strings of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Handel Messiah, cut to shreds. Well, cut, well, it's on two discs. I mean, there's, there's a lot of it's there. Um, not all of it, but a good chunk of it with Eileen Farrell, Martha Lipton, um, Davis Cunningham, and William Warfield. I mean, no. <laughs> I, I, I love I love hearing Eileen Farrell. I love hearing the soloists. Um, it's, it, well, it, it, it's a seriously heartfelt version of a modern rendering of Messiah. And it's just not going to get you very far these days, um, which is a shame, but it still has its moments. Let's just put it that way. It's got the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, of course. You want just a massive, massive choir of slightly muddy character. And there you go. I mean, it was a thrilling sound in its day. Ah, Rimsky Korsakov, the Coq d'Or. Terrific. And the Russian Easter Overture. Well, those are nice to have. And the Overture to Ruslan and Ludmila and Tchaikovsky's March Slav and Islami by Balakirev. Nothing not to like. Handel, Fireworks Suite, the Hamilton Hardy thing. Corelli, Suite for Strings, after the, it's arranged by Ettore Pinelli after the 12 Violin Sonatas, Opus 5. Well, that's a novelty. And Handel's Water Music Suite, arranged by Ormandy. Well, there you go. That's fun. You get to hear Ormandy do his own stuff. Tchaik V. Oh, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. I love this Tchaikovsky Fifth because the orchestra was still playing with Portamento back in 1959. Listen, we're on disc 24 and we're only at 1959. Wow, they were moving, weren't they? I mean, when were they not in the studio? When did they have time to give concerts? I have no idea. But in the, in the, the transitional passage of the first movement, da 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 dum, ya da da dum, ya wa da da da. I mean, they still played with that lovely portamento, which disappeared actually a few years later when they remade this, you know, for RCA or whatever, whoever else they remade it for. But it's, it's a wonderful Tchaikovsky fifth. Um, Rachmaninoff II, a classic version from 1960 with cuts, heavily, heavily cut. They were Rachmaninoff approved cuts, but they are cuts nonetheless. It was the great Rachmaninoff II until everyone started doing it complete um, without cuts, but it still holds its own as a performance. It's just terrific. And if you think the symphony is too long, then you're really going to love this performance. Shostakovich. Ah, this is with Shostakovich in present. This is from 59. The cello concerto with Rostropovich. Amazing. And symphony number one. Shostakovich himself apparently was just stunned beyond belief with the quality of the Philadelphia Orchestra when he was here for the recording sessions. Um, it was He was amazed. And they, they played their hearts out for him, which is just wonderful. Okay, Mendelssohn, first and second piano concertos with Rudolf Serkin. First with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the second's with the Columbia Symphony Orchestra. But they are reference recordings for the Mendelssohn piano concertos. Plain and simple. And then a Midsummer Night's Dream stuff, of course, with Philly. You got the Overture, the Scherzo, the Intermezzo, and the Nocturne. And they are absolutely beautiful. And here they are having fun listening to the playbacks. Yes. Uh, where are we? You got lots of nice pictures of people here. Oh, Debussy, the complete martyrdom of St. Sebastian. The whole thing. Note, in this recording, the right channel has perceptible volume shifts, which unfortunately could not be corrected completely. No, they were not co corrected completely, but they tried. And it still sounds pretty good. And you've got, let's see, Hilda Good and Soprano, um, Ethelwyn Whitmore, Mezzo, Natalie Mickle, Mezzo, Vera Zarina, the narrator. It's the narrator, the Musical Art Society of Camden, New Jersey, and the Philadelphia Orchestra Chorus, which apparently existed back then. Um, this is a great martyrdom of St. Sebastian. I don't care what anybody says about the sound. <laughs> uh, you won't hear a better one. It's, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Prokofiev Fourth Symphony, the revised version. Well, this was novel. 
This was a real novelty, and it's wonderfully done. It's a beautiful performance. Brahms' second piano concerto with Sirkin. Fabulous. Tchaikovsky Patatique. Oh, classic. Absolutely classic version. It's wonderful. Sibelius' violin concerto with David Oistrock. What's not to love? It's David Oistrock. It's Ormandy with the Swan of Tuanella. Incredible. Carmina Burana. Well, this is Carmina Burana, which has been sort of reorchestrated, and it's missing a lot of its percussion. And um, and it's it's with the Rutgers University Choir and and a bunch of soloists who you've never heard of. And I, I, I no. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, choral works in this period, in the 60s, were always done with local choirs. I mean, even the Vienna Singverein and those people, they were amateur choirs. They were they were not of the caliber that we expect to hear today. And you just have to kind of accept that and, and, and deal with it because sometimes they were okay. Sometimes they weren't the worst were the French choirs, of course. I mean, you know, they were just unbelievable. English choirs were large and kind of murky. Remember like the Huddersfield Choral Society, you know, it, but the, the, the amateurness of the choral singing was sort of part of the fun you know, it really was. I mean, you can you can turn up your nose and be very sniffy about it, or you can simply enjoy, you know, the noise everybody's making, which I do, because I was a choral singer myself, and I tend to be very forgiving, unless it's a program of a cappella choral music. Then I want to have fabulous choral singing. But in these things with the orchestra, you know, as long as they're there, as long as they do what they're supposed to, um, if they're thrilling, it's better. But if they're not, I, I tend to be kind of relaxed about it, much more than I am about orchestral playing, which for which I never have feel there's any excuse for being less than excellent. Ravel, Bolero, Tombo de Couperin, Alvarado del Gracioso, and Espana. I love this cover. Actually, actually, I have this cover. Wait a minute. Okay, here we go. Knocking things over again. Here's the cover of the Japanese Ormandy Bolero thing. Because I, you know, in, in preparation for doing this to make comparisons, I have the Japanese Ormandy Columbia edition, all of it. And it's it's on like, on like that, like a wall of CDs. So I brought them back and I've been making spot comparisons. And here is the Japanese Ravel thing. Um, see, it has Japanese all over it. There are actually two Boleros because he remade it a few years later. Um, and uh, so this was the first one. And then you've got, you know, his other Ravel things. Oh, you know, it's all wonderful. It's just first rate with the cover. Oh, yeah. Don't you love the cover with the, the lady with the, can I, can I get it without the reflection? I don't know. Well, you can see it well enough. You know, it's the, the cigarette lady. It's terrific. They could never show that today. I mean, that would be like banned as you know, harmful to children or something. So Ravel is great, and so is Espana. And then we've got, uh, we're already up at, oh, the Pavan, pardon me, there's more, Debussy's Claire de Lune, and Laval's. Ormandy always did a really good Laval's, too. It's, it's an exciting Laval's. Now, now uh, we're already up to CD 36, so we're just cruising along, 50-some-odd to go. Um, John Vincent, symphonic poem after Descartes. Yes, it's the first ever musical embodiment of I think, therefore I am, right? Je pense donc je suis. And then we've got the Franck Symphony, no, the Symphony in D by John Vincent. Um, these are, this is attractive music uh, by a guy no one's ever heard of and who has, you know, will be prevented from total obscurity by these recordings and they're worth hearing. It's, it's worth hearing, it's fun. Uh, Bach by Ormandy. We have Bach's, uh, Bach arrangements by Ormandy, not Stokowski. You've got the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. You can compare it to Leopold Stokowski. Uh, Johann Christian Bach, Symphonia for Double Orchestra in E flat. Then you've got the Toccata, Adagio, and Fugue in C major, and the Passacaglia and Fugue in C minor. Yay! Oh, that's fun to listen to. Ormandy's arrangements are just as much fun as Stokowski's, frankly. Ormandy, The Four Seasons. Oh my God. With Anshel Brusolo. Yay! He's now the concertmaster after Kretsch Malik or Kretsch Malak or whatever his name was. And so now he's there doing the Four Seasons. I mean, I, I you want to hear, I, everyone did it, you know, back in the day and they did it in a perfectly unidiomatic, modern way and I couldn't care less. They're lovely performances. 
Grieg, Pyrgin Suite number one, Sibelius Falls Trees, Alfin, Swedish Rhapsody number one, the Midsummer Marvaka. This was the only Alfin any of us ever got to hear for like all of our lives until the abyss and you know, Swedish people showed up doing Swedish music. I mean, that was like, whoa, yay, here comes more Alfin. That was fun. Then we realized all we cared about was the Swedish Rhapsody number one. Just kidding. Uh, Finlandia, yay, with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir screaming, this is my homeland, this is my native land. Oh, God, it's awful with a, with a choir. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, arrangement of On on Great Lone Hills. That's what, how they sing it. On Great Lone Hills. I, I wonder if they've ever been to Finland. Finland has no hills. Finland is flat. <laughs> it's flat and full of lakes, you know, but... Norway has hills. So, I mean, you know, you've seen one Scandinavia thing. You've seen them all, I guess. And then Ansaga. Yay! Ansaga. Yummy. William Walton. The Violin Concerto. Uh, and let's see. And Edward Lalo, the Symphony Espanol in the four-movement version, which I kind of like because I hate the piece. The the less of it you do, the better. With Zeno Francescati. I mean, he it's Metropolis in the Lalo. But it's Walton doing Walton. Yes, it's Walton. No, it's Walton with Ormandy. So it's, uh, yeah, and Metropolis doing Lalo. Vivaldi, Concerti with Isaac Stern and David Oistrock with William R. Smith, harpsichordist. They do a bunch of violin concerti, double violin concerti. Well, that's a nice disc. That's fun to hear. Just two fabulous violinists sort of, you know, schmoozing. Rachmaninoff, Symphonic Dances and Kazella Paganiniana. Okay. <sighs> Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. I always had an issue with this re performance. Remastering has not helped it. It's not a bad performance, but it is somewhat rigid rhythmically and, again, sounds rather faded and colorless sonically. There are so many better versions of the Symphonic Dances. I mean, honestly. And and I we had a whole discussion in this channel about Symphonic Dance recordings, and some of you swore by Ormandy. And I'm telling you, I, I, I if you do, you do but you are really missing what the piece can be um, if you're sticking to this one. On the other hand, Paganiniana by Casella is delightful. Absolutely delightful. Um, Tchaikovsky, The Serenade for Strings with no repeats in the first movement, which makes it only five minutes and 49 seconds long. I have no problem with that. Um, and then Borden's Nocturne and Barber's Adagio for Strings and the Vaughan Williams Fantasia on Green Sleeves and the Grieg Two Elegiac Melodies, Schubert's Serenade, William McDowell, oh, Edward McDowell's To a Wild Rose. It's William McDowell, I don't know. Massenet's The Meditation from Thais. It's all string stuff and it's lovely string stuff. Uh, oh, Johann Strauss II. Okay, it's a, it's a Strauss thing. Need I say more? It's, oh, the Blue Danube is there, and Tales of the Vienna Woods, and, you know, Kaiser Waltz, and all the most popular waltz things played very waltzy-like. Um, Richard Yardumian, okay, well, he was a local Philly composer type and wrote attractive, interesting music. We've got, oh, all kinds of interesting things here with Lily Chukasian, um, the Symphony Number no. 2, Psalms for Medium Voice and Orchestra, his Cantus Anime et Cordis for String Orchestra, the Veni Sancte Spiritus Chorale Prelude, and the Passacaglia Recitative and Fugue for Piano and Orchestra with John Pennink, pianist. It's an interesting selection of stuff, 68 minutes worth of Yardumian. So give it a listen, see what you think. The Max Rager Piano Concerto with Rudolf Serkin, still hands down the best recording of this albatross of a piano concerto, and quite frankly, the only one I can tolerate because it moves. It's faster than anybody else. It doesn't sound fast. I mean, nothing Rager wrote really fast, does it? But, um, I mean, it's still 38 minutes long, but 38 minutes of Rager piano concerto is a hell of a lot better than 55 minutes of Rager piano concerto, which you get in some other spots. And, you know, Serkin loved the work and, and was a passionate advocate. And Ormandy is his usual fabulous self as an accompanist. And if you care about this work and want to know what it can sound like at its best, that's the version to get, period. Nothing else comes close. Uh, Weber, uh, Introduction to the Dance, and, and List, Mephisto Waltz, and Sanson, Danse Macabre. 
And let's see, Brahms, 21 Hungarian dances, of which there are one, two, three, four, five of them. Oh, the Dvorak orchestrations. So it's 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Um, the Russian Sailors Dance by Glier, the Overture to Urianthi by Weber, and, and the Polka and Fugue from Schwanda der Dudelsach Pfeiffer by Weinberger. That's a collection. Berlioz, the Symphony Fantastique. I always liked the Symphony Fantastique. I really did. I always have. And uh, the finale has one, two, three, four different tracks. It's all divided up. And you get the back and out from Samson and Delilah, the best ever performance of that, and a fabulous Saucer's Apprentice. I mean, this is all amazing stuff. It really is. And the Symphony Fantastique is surprisingly good. I know it's not Charles Munch. It doesn't have that level of, of frenzy about it, but it flows, and the playing is miraculous, and yeah, it's all right. Strauss, Ein Heldenleben. Well, Ormandy always did wonderful. Strauss, again, you're competing with Reiner, who is the ultimate Ein Heldenlebenist. But um, as far as Ein Heldenlebens go, it's a very good Ein Heldenleben. It's wonderfully played. It's rich and yummy and juicy and terrific. Chopin, Piano Concerto Number 1, Liszt Totentanz with Alexander Brylovsky. Well, that's fun. That's definitely fun. It's worth hearing. Belshazzar's Feast with the Rutgers University Choir, and Roussel, Bacchus and Ariadne, Suite Number 2. Well, the Roussel is wonderful, and Belshazzar's Feast isn't bad. It really isn't. It's a little bit rough and ready. You know, I mean, the Rutgers University Choir is, is a college glee club, like I sang in, <laughs> for example. And But they're good. I mean, they're good. And it's, it's okay. I mean, you know, again, we were not going to hear you know, the EMI recordings over on these shores. So when Ormandy did a piece like this, first of all, it was exciting because it was fresh and it was new. But second of all, there wasn't going to be any competition. And so, uh, you know, it was what we knew. Uh, now, of course, there's tons of competition and you can compare this to a million other ones. But but I, I think, you know, the, the exercise of hearing, you know, what we could do, listen to in 1960, 1960, it's pretty good. Pretty good for its time, anyway. Uh, Ravel, piano concerto for the left hand with Robert Casadesu, beautiful. Mozart, concerto for two pianos with Robert and Gabby Casadesu, it's wonderful. Bartok, uh, violin concerto number one and Viotti's concerto number 22. Well, there's an interesting coupling with Isaac Stern. It was rare repertoire and well done, very well done. Um, Ormandy, uh, no, Ormandy, yeah, this is Ormandy. Mozart, Mozart, what am I talking about? Piano Concerto 22, Piano Concerto number four, Piano Sonata number four, pardon me, at E flat, with Entremont. Well, you know, it's all right. It's decent. Tchaikovsky, Sleeping Beauty. How much of it do we get? Excerpts. So it's excerpts from Sleeping Beauty, very, very beautifully done. I mean, yes, it's wonderful. There's nothing not to like. Franck, Symphony in D minor. Ormandy always did a good Franck D minor. Always, always, always. This is beautiful. Uh, Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto with David Oistrock. Classic version, right? Yes. Um, of course, we have Mendelssohn and Tchaikovsky, right, already with Isaac Stern. We get a few Tchaikovsky Violin Concertos in here. Brahms Piano Concerto number one with Stern and Ormandy. No, it's Serkin, pardon me. Serkin and Ormandy. Fabulous, too. You know, Serkin's Brahms Piano Concerto with Zell get all the attention, but some prefer his Ormandy's, and I think they're every bit is good. I really do. Even the orchestral accompaniments are just amazing. So that's terrific. Swan Lake excerpts. Oh, what's not to like? Again, just like Sleeping Beauty. Beautiful. Strauss, Don Juan, Death and Transfiguration. I mean, classic Ormandy Philly stuff. Beautiful performances. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, Johann Christian Bach. Oh, this is the Bach family album. You get Johann Christian Bach and Wilhelm Friedman Bach and and then Henri Casadesu, who had nothing to do with Bach, his concerto for four violas, concertante, and orchestra in the style of CPE Bach. Well, there's something worth hearing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, we're up to CD 62. Tchaikovsky, Symphony Number no. 7, an E flat. What, you ask? There is no Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. 7. Well, there is now. No, it was actually assembled. Um, restored, instrumented, and edited by Semyon Bogatyev. 
Bobokatirev, pardon me. And it's not terribly convincing, as you might expect. It's the same sketches that became Tchaikovsky's third piano concerto, I think. And you could do anything you want with them. But, you know, there was a Tchaikovsky seventh that if anyone was going to record it and let us hear what it sounded like, it was Ormandy, and he does it with his typical finesse. Uh, Carnival in Vienna. Oh, it's Strauss. More Strauss stuff. Strauss family goodies. Oh, Scheherazade. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. No, there's no tam-tam at the end. But you don't hear tam-tams at the end of most Scheherazades, quite frankly, and I don't understand why. But it's just yummy and fabulously well played. And Anshel Brusolo is a wonderful Scheherazade. Then we have the glorious sound of Christmas. Okay, you get it. You know it's all the usual stuff. Is it with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir? It's got to be. Well, I don't know. Let me see. Uh, no, the Temple University Choir. Okay. Well, it's Christmas stuff. You don't need that many people to sing it. Um, Delius. Oh, this is great. One of the all-time great Delius albums. Brig Fair. Dance Rhapsody number two. On hearing the first cuckoo in spring in a summer garden. Just fantastic. And I, I you know, a, a recording that was never going to get any attention on the other side of the pond where you had Beecham and those people, but the playing is so much better than anything you were hearing on the other side of the pond, number one. And number two, um, we would never have exposure to that music. And again, I, I just think one of the wonderful things about going through this box is realizing just what a high level we got to hear this. You know, we were on when we got to hear some of this unusual repertoire. I mean, it was done as well as you were going to hear it anywhere, even if it wasn't going to get any attention. Um, let's see. Now we have George Baratti, his chamber concerto for flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and strings, a little neoclassical bonbon uh, with members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and George Rockberg, Symphony Number no. 2. That's the New York Philharmonic under Werner Torkinovsky. Well, isn't that fabulous to have, even if it isn't all Eugene Ormandy. Um, Sibelius, Symphony No. 1, and the Violin Concerto with Isaac Stern. Well, it's a very good Violin Concerto. The Symphony No. 1 is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And Ormandy reorchestrates the last chords of the, you know, last movement. You, know, you get a little more harp there, you know, thwomp, thwomp. Oh, yes. So there's a little bit of rescoring. I mean, boy, the finale. Oh, my God. The big tune in the finale is so succulent. You just want to die. It's gorgeous. It's fabulous, Sibelius one. It doesn't sound like anybody else. And here's a novelty. Poulenc, the concerto for organ, strings, and timpani. I mean, you know, Munch did that in Boston. Um, and here we have it with E. Power Biggs. And it's great. <laughs> it's absolutely great. You, and you get the Richard Strauss fest, Festlich his Preludium, his festival prelude for lots of brass and organ, and the Barber Toccata Festiva for organ and orchestra. That's with Bernstein and the New York Phil. Wow, boy, though. Yes. Wait a minute. No, the Strauss is with Bernstein. Pardon me. And the Poulenc and the Barber are with Ormandy and E. Power Biggs. Fantastic stuff. Absolutely fantastic. Bartok, let's see, Piano Concerto Number 1 with the Columbia Symphony and George Sell and Circuit, and the Prokofiev Piano Concerto Number 4 for Left Hand, the one nobody cares about. And this isn't a performance that's going to make you care about it. I don't know if any performance can make you care about it. With Philadelphia and Ormandy and Circuit, but it's in the Circuit box. It's a Circuit, Circuit, Circuit thing, right? Um, this is my country, the world's great songs of patriotism and brotherhood with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Okay, there you go. America, oh, you get America and you get like other places. Um, Al Jacobs, this is my country. Yeah, all right, lovely. So yeah, Columbia, the gem of the ocean, you know, all that patriotic stuff. Bartok, Bluebeard's Castle in English. Oh, it's fabulous. I love this performance. It's First of all, the orchestra is amazing. And the singing is absolutely great. Rosalind Elias and Jerome Hines are fabulous in the title roles. And you don't understand what they're saying anyway most of the time. And, uh, you know, I, I reviewed this on classicstoday.com. And, and if you want to have a chance, take a look at it. Because I, I do a little of my own version of the English dialogue. You know, here is my castle, Judith. Hmm, needs a little redecorating, don't you think, dear? Are you afraid, Judith? Well, there is sort of that, 
that issue about, you know, those other women who seem to have disappeared. Never mind. Give me the keys. Open the doors. You know, anyway. Yes, they do all that stuff. And now here's a real novel. It's great. It's great. It's just great. Here's a real novelty. The Bach B minor mass, all of it. This, I mean, I didn't even know Ormandy did a B minor mass until this came out. And I've had a great time listening to it. It's really good of its kind. It's a modern, completely not historical version of it, but it's with the Temple University choirs, more than one of them, and Eleanor Stieber, Rosalind Elias, Richard Vero, and Richard Cross. And it's the whole thing. And it's, it's, it's surprisingly good, really surprisingly good and worth hearing. The Glorious Sound of Wagner. Oh my God, this is CD 75. We're getting there. And it, glorious it is. It's astonishing. It's one of the great Wagner records ever. You get, you get the Tannhäuser um, Overture and the Bacchanal, all 25 minutes of it. You'll never hear it done like that. It's incredible. The Siegfried Idyll, it only takes 15 minutes. Beautiful. The Siegfried Forest Murmurs, um, Meistersinger, uh, Prelude to Act Three, and and Dance of the you know Apprentices and, and Entry of the Masters, and the Lohengrin Prelude to Act Three. This is unbelievably fabulous. Just unbelievable. Shostakovich Four it was the premiere for a lot of us. I mean, it was recorded about the same, 63, just about at the same time that Kondrashin made his recording, which none of us could ever hear. The work was only premiered, I think, in 61. And and there it was in a, a wonderful performance. Some people now find it to be a little bit soft-edged. And it is. I mean, it is. It's the Philadelphia Orchestra. It's their characteristic sound. But it's still a wonderful performance. And it can't say in the Fourth Symphony that it's lacking anything in, 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 in sheer oomph. The oomph is there, believe me. Walton, facade with Vera Zorina, narrator. Well, that's fun. With a little chamber ensemble. I mean, that's delightful. He did a lot of Walton, you'll notice. The Violin Concerto, Belshazzar's Feast, facade. You know, he was getting play over here, which is great. Hiber, Divertissement, and Escal, Ports of Call. Great disc. Great disc. Tons of fun. The Divertissement may sound a little bit a little bit big for its scale. You know, it's a chamber orchestra work and it's a little fulsome in this performance, but it's still a lot of fun. Mozart. Oh, this is Mozart uh, Wind Concerti. The Bassoon Concerto and the Flute Concerto with William Kincaid and Bernard Garfield and the Oboe Concerto with John Delancey and the Clarinet Concerto with Anthony Giliotti. Again, if you want to hear the amazing wind soloists of the Philadelphia Orchestra, this was issued in a separate box of Ormandy Does All the Mozart Wind Concerti. Um, so uh, that was available. It's probably not anymore, of course, but um, all that stuff is in here, of course. Richard Yardumian, he's back. His Symphony Number no. 1 and his Violin Concerto with Anshul Brusolo. These are nice pieces. They're worth hearing. They're, they're neoclassical and and enjoyable. Symphony Number no. 1 has three movements, Legend, Aria, and March. I mean, how could you not like that? Seriously. Sasson Organ Symphony with E. Power Biggs, one of the great ones. It's just marvelous. And the Carnival of the Animals. Yeah, with Claude Frank and Lillian Collier. It's beautifully done. And the swan sounds like a swan, as it did not sound like with Franz Xavier, Francois Xavier Roth and Lysiecla recently. Yeah. This swan does not have asthma. It sounds like I have asthma. I sound like that swan. This one is a real swan. A festival of marches, marches by everybody, including Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance Number no. 1, the Radetzky March, the Guno Funeral March of a Marionette, um, oh, the American Salute by Morton Gould, which is really fun, the Verdi Triumphal March from Aida, the Prelude to Carmen, March of the Toys, the Meyerbeer Coronation March from the Prophet, Stars and Stripes Forever. Fun, just fun. Brahms, German Requiem, with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, uh, with Phyllis Curtin and Jerome Hines. It's a very well-paced, very smart Brahms German Requiem, because Ormandy always did a good German Requiem. Whether or not you like the choral singing, well, uh, that's going to be a matter of taste. Of course, I had a discussion with Jed Distler about this particular performance. I liked it a little better than he did. He really didn't like the choral singing, and I, I understand. I really understand, but it was it was a type. 
a type that was very popular in its day. And the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is what it is. And so there you go. It's sung in English, by the way. So uh, there you go. Um, that may rule it out for many of us anyway. So there, that's the way it is. Prokofiev 6. Well, that was fun to have. That was really a novelty back in the day. Nobody did the Sixth Symphony ever. Um, and this is a good performance, of course. Uh, Mozart, concerto for three pianos. Bach, concerto for three keyboards. You've got Robert Gebbi and Jean Casadesu and the Bach Italian Concerto with Robert Casadesu on piano. So that's fun. Chopin, Les Sylphides, the complete ballet orchestrated by Roy Douglas. I mean, that's always yummy. And it sounds yummy. And then we've got some, oh, music from Delib, Sylvia excerpts and Coppelia excerpts. And the Chopin Nocturne in E-flat major arranged by Arthur Harris. Well, that's a fun collection of goodies. Strauss, Don Quixote, oh, we're at the end, almost with Lorne Monroe cello and Carlton Cooley viola and Block Shlomo with Leonard Rose. Great stuff. Absolutely great stuff. Nothing not to love. And then finally on CD 88, Rachmaninoff Piano Concerti 1 and 4 with Philippe Entremont, because of course in those days, the great Rachmaninoff pianists like Rubinstein and Horowitz and those people wouldn't be caught, be caught dead doing the first and fourth piano concerti, but Entremont was up for it. And they're very good performances and it completed Ormandy doing Rachmaninoff's piano concerti with various people at various times. So that, my friends, is 88 CDs of Ormandy and Philly from only five years. I still am astonished. I really am. Here it is. I mean, should you get it? Of course you should. Absolutely. For, only for the B minor mass, you should have this. And, uh, you know, and the air power suite. And you can see it's standard stuff, familiar stuff, some unusual stuff, and all played at an extraordinary level of accomplishment. I don't like all of it equally. Of course not. Neither will you. But there's a lot more to enjoy than there is not to enjoy. And I'm just looking forward to the next one. I guess we have to wait like a whole year or something like that. Who knows? Or more. If it shows up, just, just pray that it does. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.